Moving on to. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Uh, and then moving on to access control equipment. Uh, so we're using approved contract here in this case. This is why it's being brought up. So uh, Mr. Brantner, want to talk to us about that? Good evening, board members. Um, I apologize if my voice is a little scratchy. I'm one of the many, many members of uh, the district who is currently fighting through COVID. So um, I will mute my setup if I start to cough a little bit, but I apologize if it's a little scratchy or if it's difficult to hear me, please let me know. Uh, we're bringing to you a decision this evening um, related to some funds that were set aside at the beginning of last year uh, concerning our access control upgrade across the district. Uh, we are seeking to utilize a state contract for cost savings and uh, best use of taxpayer funds within this upgrade. We'd like to um, identify Verkata um, as the access control hardware and licensing vendor for the, the system. Um, we're asking for $311,288.55 to be approved for purchasing of uh, hardware and licenses only. So the rest of the project will continue through an RFP process for the installation and the door handles and other accessories. But uh, we've been able to identify that by utilizing this uh, state contract system, we can re realize significant savings to the district and just purchase this hardware now before the end of year um, price increases go into effect based on the supply and demand within the current um, economic uh, environment we find ourselves in. So purchasing this equipment and setting it aside and then incorporating that equipment that we purchased into the RFP process when that comes up for the installation and the rest of the equipment. If we go through our purchasing uh, before the 2021 pricing structure ends, we've realized that we can uh, save approximately $90,000 on purchasing this equipment now and setting it aside, and then going through the rest <coughs> going through the rest of the RFP process. So we would like to ask to purchase this equipment now and set it aside and then proceed with the rest of the RFP process and incorporate the previously purchased equipment so that we can realize those significant cost savings. And right, happy to any questions. questions on this? Yeah, what does PEPPM stand for? So it's colloquially just referred to as PEPM, but it's a state contract purchasing agreement, much like many others that exist. Um, it's uh, several states have set up a contract purchasing agreement where they'll receive the competitive bids on specific categories um, for other government agencies to then utilize for the competitive bidding process. So they manage the entire competitive bidding process and then award those contracts to the vetted bidders. Um, and then we're able to utilize and other government agencies are able to utilize those state contracts that are approved for government use um, to meet the financial guidelines um, and save us the time and expense of going through those processes. Okay, but you don't know what the acronym stands for? It um, stands for Pennsylvania Education Purchasing Program for Microcomputers, but that is actually something. It, it's it's like that's a, how it originally started, it but goes. it has nothing to do with that anymore. It's completely outgrown it. Mm. Okay, so, so what we're trying to prove here is that we pursue the, uh, the process of acquiring this equipment, and we'll utilize that uh, approved contract as a basis for uh, getting this thing all accomplished, and which will save us money in the process. It saves us a significant amount of money. Um, we, we found that we get much better prices through that than even through the RFPs because the manufacturers um, competitively bid those uh, state contracts previously. So, um, and additionally, if we if we purchase through the state contract uh, prior to the RFP process before the um, escalation of prices for the 2022 season, um, we we know for a fact that the specific price for this contract is going to increase $90,000 starting um, February 1st. So just purchasing this equipment right now, as opposed to February 1st and setting it aside, saves us $90,000 for the district for other projects. Okay, any, any further questions? I do comments? have one, Mike. Um, 
so is this this is a an approved vendor but we will actually have the contract with the company right we're not going through the state and then the state handles the the contract directly with the uh with the company right we're dealing with them directly we're just using an approved vendor that correct this is a third party that has Basically, this third party just handles all of the RFP process um, for the bidding and, and the posting and the certification of that and just takes that time and expense away from the other government agencies so we can just utilize that bidding process and then have individual contracts through that. Okay. We haven't done a lot of, of contract purchasing um, through state contracts with the district, right. so it's been a fun process to uh, get our feet wet in to do this uh this purchaser yeah I, I can actually add one of the documents that we received from pepham was an 80 page document that went through exhaustive detail of the how they did the the, the how they did the rfp that led to for led to Verkata getting the contract for this for this product um i i would be more than happy to share that with with, with the board uh, it, it is available because I, I can tell you that we we actually had a conversation with Pepham, Randy, myself, and and Michael, to kind of just make sure that we understood how the process worked, that it fit in with the financial guidelines that we have established. And um, I included in, in the board packet. You can see the form that we use internally to ensure that it actually does meet meet our guidelines. This would be a good time to really also thank Randy. Um, for his assistance with this, and also, although he's no longer with us, Mike Varnett, who who started the process with us as well. It's been yeah, an we've, adventure. We've we've been looking at the the proper routes to find the best savings and and to structure this installation and contracts since we originally brought this to the board and had the capital funds set aside, and I believe it was March of last year. And, all, and when you send out the RFP for the additional <clears throat> items that need to be purchased, they, what you're purchasing now will not be outdated for the additional stuff that you're getting, right? Because that's Correct. scary in that, you know, right. in the industry. And then we're, by purchasing this, um, we're purchasing our licenses for the equipment through this. So okay. there's a 120 day, um, Push off time period. So purchasing this, our licenses will start in 120 days. Okay. Um, so we have that 120 days to get the rest of the RFP out, um, get it bidded, get it received, analyzed, uh, and awarded after that point. So uh, we'll, we'll have that 120 days for installation. Okay. But yeah, there's many other components of this. This is just um, purchasing some of the actual hardware. Okay. for the project. Okay, I can entertain a motion to uh, to approve this, uh, this proposal. I'll move to approve the access control equipment as presented. And I just have to say that any procurement process, especially with government is never simple. Yes. That's why it's 80 pages long. <laughs> I tried to put it in your board package. John told me that you guys didn't want it. I will say he's not kidding. I took it out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'll second that. If, I didn't hear anybody else second it, but I'll second it. Okay, it's been uh, moved and seconded. So all in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed say uh, nay. Okay, it's a pass. So uh, good luck there, Michael. Moving on to the next item, it's uh, something that uh, Gary's going to discuss. It has to do with the roof being a uh, replacement or, or at least major work uh, because of the windstorm we had a while back and the damage that was caused. So, uh, Gary, you want to tell us what, what's going on here? Yeah, so in, in that windstorm mid December, uh, unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the wind was so strong that it actually got up underneath the, the roofing membrane at east and lifted it up and delaminated it from, from its uh, fiber board. Uh, luckily, we were able to get uh, weathercraft out there within an hour to start 
uh, trying to salvage and keep the membrane from detaching altogether. Uh, we've got hundreds of sandbags up there now. Uh, we're, we've been dealing with some uh, uh, periodic leaks uh, just from, from this occurring. Uh, hopefully we, we've got them uh, contained at, the, at this point, but I think it's gonna be a, a challenge for us going forward until we get the roof replaced. I've uh, been working with the adjuster as well. Uh, and we did get their second report late yesterday afternoon, uh, outlining their uh, estimate as well as the scope of work, provided the scope of work to Weathercraft um, this, this morning. And, and we hope to see some, some numbers from them in the next couple of days. Uh, we did, I don't know, John, if you wanna go over the numbers of uh, what I sent over to you as far as the, the actual cash value that uh, the insurance at this point uh, has us sitting at uh, versus the uh, replacement cost value, which is about, uh, according to them, they have it at about $638,000 for replacement. I think that's low myself just from dealing with the Penrose Library roof uh, quotes and everything. So uh, still working with them on, uh, you know, so I don't know that that number is going to end up there. We did have depreciation factored in to their final uh, claim cost, uh, which brought it down because the roof is 20 or 22 years old. So there was quite a bit. They, they uh, depreciated about 50% of the materials. So that brought it down a, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to, to I think, 440. Uh, $440,000. And then with our, our $50,000 deductible, that brings us in at about $390,000. Um, I have been talking with uh, another roofing consultant, just kind of a peer review. Um, doesn't have all the, the information, but uh, um, the, the consultant that I'm talking with was the, the consultant that worked on the 21C roof replacement. He is familiar with the East Library. Uh, he provided a thorough inspection and, and evaluation of the system back in 2020, uh, which gave me another seven years. Of course, that was the one that blew away and, and Penrose lost one piece of flashing that we were able to retrieve. So uh, I did Send, put in a, a, a brief summarization of the damage that mm -hmm. library district sustained in the board packet. And uh, so at, at this point, like, like I said in that memo, we're approaching this as a, an emergency similar to what happened with the boiler and, and getting the contractors on as quickly as possible. Again, uh, uh, Weathercraft uh, you know, has been on site helping us secure the building or secure the roof. And uh, they were actually the, the contractor that replaced 21C's roof back in 19, uh, 2019. So uh, we're planning on moving in that direction unless things just you know, blow up altogether. But at this point, that's where we're at. And they do have, have enough material in-house at this time to batten down the existing roof until uh, additional materials for replacement are, are obtained. So uh, we, we felt that the biggest risk was another storm coming up and us losing the roof altogether. So um, again, there's hundreds of sandbags all over the roof up there at this time. So while insurance is going to pay for part of this, uh, our cost is about 350K, you say? Uh, the 390 is what they, they've... Uh, the, the claim will pay out at this point. Uh, I suspect it'll go up a little bit, but uh, again, we're still working with the adjuster, with Weathercraft, and I'm talking with this other consultant as well. Uh, so depending on the replacement cost, um, we could, you know, I, I, I hesitate to even throw out a number there because of of with supply costs and everything at this point, so. Well, there's, yeah, the, no, okay. there's no doubt this is an emergency from the standpoint that uh, <laughs> the roof has you know, potential hazards to doing further damage to inside uh, the building, so. 
Yeah, if you take into consideration the uh, B and M contract base at seven hundred forty-five thousand dollars for Penrose, that's actually uh, a larger or smaller roof than the east roof. So uh, you can kind of gauge the cost going forward. Uh, well, for I understand east. that this roof is uh, was within your cycle for getting replaced anyway. Is that correct? It was. Uh, again, I had. Like I said, I had uh, Rich McReynolds, uh, the consultant that I've been talking with, do a thorough inspection two years ago of Penrose and East. And Penrose, of course, came up with the, the, the most urgent need. East, he did give it another five to seven years. Uh, so I was hoping to, to push that out, you know, at least three or four years before we started uh, planning and designing the re replacement on that, but unfortunately, Mother Nature had, right. had uh, different different ideas. I guess schedule. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other, have anybody else have any other comments or questions for uh, Rit, for uh, Gary? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I hear? Uh... Well, th th there's no motion on this. It was it was just a discussion. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, 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 where the motion and, and where things will probably come into it, if we are treating it as an emergency, that does give us the authority to move forward with it. But there is, of course, then um, this was not something that we did budget for. So the board action will happen at the mid-year budget resolution when we would do the necessary transfer of funds to actually pay for it. Okay. Okay, moving right along to reports. Uh, Friends of Pike Peaks Library District report. I think, uh, is this Beverly here? No, this is Rita. Okay, Rita. So um, we've had uh, a busy couple months. Uh, we keep working uh, on the action items that came out of our October retreat. And so just uh, last, last week at our meeting, we passed, uh, we approved the 2022 objectives for the various committees that they will be working on for 2022. I wanted to point out that in the report, I showed the sales for November and December and December. So because of Christmas was coming, I think we had some robust sales. It's interesting yeah. where those sales increased. Most of the places were steady. Amazon almost doubled. And the other area that um, really jumped was the web storefront. Mm -hmm. um, the others sort of stayed, you know, you're always going to see a little bit of an increase or decrease, but I thought that was interesting uh, because during this entire time of the pandemic, our e-sales, uh, Amazon, eBay, the storefront have been through the e-sales. Um, the branches uh, are, recovering and starting to increase their sales but the all the other problem that the branches right now are having is our donations are down which is interesting because you would think that people were clearing out things while they were stuck in their houses but obviously they weren't getting rid of their books so every time i see somebody i say you know if you're cleaning out your library books bring them to your branch library because we'd love to have them so we're trying to pass the word the other thing is um, at East Library and Penlose Library, those bookstores, we've done a little bit of a facelift, primarily in the children's area, once again, to, to try and get folks in. And we will do the same thing for uh, 21C. Um, right now, we're getting close just a couple months before we have our spring, uh, big spring book sale. Um, so we're focused on that. And the last big news is that our annual meeting is on Saturday and we're going to do a hybrid because we just, you know, there were enough folks who said, I'm not going to come in in person, but we have folks who feel comfortable. So we're, you know, it's up in the air. You never know how it's going to turn out when you have these hybrid, hybrid meetings. Um, but so we're looking forward to it because a lot of folks are pleased that programs are picking up back at the library. And so we wanted to sort of give folks the opportunity if they wanted to come in and see us face to face that they could do that. Otherwise they're going to join us via Zoom. That's all I have. Anybody have any questions, uh, Rita? All right, thank you, Rita. Nice job. Okay, Lance, uh, Pike Peak Library District Foundation Report. 
Hi, good evening. Um, any questions about the report as submitted? Anyone? Excellent. Uh, this, this just is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. You know, every time you come around, you talk about the thousands of dollars you get to give to the library. And it's just absolutely amazing how you guys do this. Well, it, it has been a very good year. And, um, and, and we continue to see the fruits of the Carl Bloom being the engine for donor acquisition. And, and, uh, and I think we're I, I think the one thing that I really like to tease out about the year in giving that I'm that I'm most excited about is we saw a lot of people who made their first gift during the Library Giving Day campaign back in March and April, and they have already come back and made a second gift for the year in giving campaign. Uh, and so I, I was just curious to see how that was going to shake out and and. Um, I, I don't have any, I, I have anecdotal evidence to support that, but I don't have any hard numbers right now because quite honestly, gifts are still coming in. So um, hopefully we'll have some more solid numbers for you in February, but um, all in all, things are good in the foundation world right now. Great. Anybody have any comments or questions for Lance? Good job, Lance, and your team, of course. Thank you. Yeah, thanks again, Lance. Nice job. Okay, uh, financial report, uh, Randy. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Sorry, I was muted. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, let's start off by talking at the uh, financials for November. Um, I plan on having de December with. Uh, January's next next month, um, and obviously you guys have looked this over, and, and the dashboard um, is something that you've seen over and over. And the numbers, uh, the top chart, you know, just demonstrates our cash and investments are are strong and trending similar to previous years. But um, you know, because of the increased revenue and tax base, um, we're pulling more money in. Um, our Overall sales for November over last year, same time, were 5.6% uh, up from, from this period last year. And um, many of the things that were true the last time I talked to you guys in November are true now. Um, the only comment that I really wanted to pinpoint on is the other. Um, with Lance's help, I mentioned this last time, we uh, applied for CVRF um, grants, and we recognized $404,000 in 2021. So that's one reason why that number has jumped so much in 21 over 20. Um, the next page is basically just a breakdown of the individual um, numbers, uh, the federal funds, other categories. Um, I need to see if some of that has come through in December. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. Uh, the E-rate funding, um, we basically had to cancel uh, at least one of those for timing reasons, and it's basically moving off into the future. So we should have an update on that um, shortly. We've got an E-rate consultant we work with, and. Um, she really has done a lot of good work for us. Um, but right now over with budget, we're at 98.2% 90, of our budget and still have another month to go. Um, I did want to mention too that uh, special ownership taxes really picked up this last year. Um, I guess people being shut in in 20, they didn't buy a whole lot of vehicles and trailers and whatnot. And they really um, kicked in on that in 21. Um, Personnel, our expenses are um, about 2.2% of uh, 2020. I'm sorry, the change from 2020 is 2.2%. And uh, one of the lines on there that 
pops out is uh, the supplies number for 2020 was $204,000 higher than 21. And again, it's due to COVID supply purchases in, in 20 that are being covered by um, the CDRF grant money. Um, IT also got tasked to purchase a, a lot of laptops in January that, that kind of drove our number up on our capital outlay. And then the operating transfers are just per the transfers that were on the um, approved budget. Um, the only thing on the individual um, categories, pers personnel services, again, you guys have seen this, we're at 86.6% .6 of our budgeted number for this year. And uh, again, same reason we're down in staff and um, just continue to basically try to get more people in the door and, and um, see how that turns out. Uh, Taona will probably be talking about that a little bit more when she comes on. Um, the numbers on the special fund and the capital funds are pretty straightforward. There's been a little bit of movement on the special fund that's basically just running those down to zero. And and then East and uh, Penrose and Library 21 and all the capital reserves for all the different departments are, are just basically running through budget numbers on multi-year contracts. And our cash for the month um, ended at 21.5% million, um, which is a strong finish for November. And, uh, you know, we just, I, I, it's great working for a place who has enough money to pay their bills. That's all I can tell you, because I've worked for places that haven't. Uh, <laughs> so, and again, um, I, I'll have December, um, finished up and do that along with the um, first one for 22, January, next month. Does anybody have any questions? All right, thanks Randy, appreciate uh, your report. You're welcome. Yeah, moving, moving along here, uh, public services report, uh, Tiona. Good evening, everyone. Um, so it's very nice to see all of you. And in some ways, it's kind of deja vu for me. I thought that by now we would be done with COVID. I believe it started about, about two years ago. So, um, and here we are. Um, we're doing our best to serve our community despite a lot of staffing challenges, not, not because we're not hiring, and training, but we have, like Michael Bretner mentioned, a uh, very high uh, number of staff members who are out because of COVID. Uh, uh, and I want to thank all public services uh, directors and managers and supervisors and all staff for uh, ensuring that we uh, continue providing such excellent customer service to our con community, despite all of the challenges that we face every day. And honestly, every day is very unpredictable, but um, because of the strong teams that we have, uh, we, we manage to continue doing uh, the work we're doing. So do, if anyone has any questions from the report, I will be more than happy to answer. But, and also um, I would like to share some of the initiatives that we embarked on with some of our partner organizations in the community. So uh, we are working with uh, a rescue mission uh, and right now Temi Sales um, is working on a plan to start providing computer classes at their location. And I want to thank West Region and Penrose Library Manager because uh, our staff from Penrose Library will be providing those services at that location. So that's exciting. 
Also, uh, Brett Labella, the regional director, uh, the director of regional history and genealogy, and Jean Carrier, the monument library ma branch manager, um, complete a partnership agreement with uh, Western Museum and Mining and Industry. So we will start offering story time at their location and occasionally they will add that flair of history there. So, and we have some other plans with them as well. And of course, all of you heard that we hosted uh, Isaac Newton Parrish Jr. And um, thank to communications team and all services and branches. Um, uh, it was uh, actually very informative and I was privileged to have a meeting with him and I was fascinated that um, also his focus was on the unity and uh, how all of us are Americans and we should never forget that. So do you, any questions from the report or any other questions? Uh, if I have answers, I will be happy to uh, provide those answers. If I don't have answers, I will, uh, I will find answers I work at the library. <laughs> uh, Tiona, I do have a question. Uh, I noticed that DEI had, um, they had presentations on Kwanzaa and several other holidays around uh, our Christian Christmas holiday that we mm -hmm. have uh, celebrate. I did want to ask, is there ever going to be an opportunity for uh, someone in the department to make presentations for our Latin American community that celebrate Los, Re Los Dia de los Reyes, which is uh, the kings, the three mm -hmm. kings, as well as Posadas, Las Posadas, mm -hmm. and uh, the celebration of the Virgen de Guadalupe, because those are very important holidays for them. And I think that would uh, provide some inclusivity if we did that. Excellent, thank you very much, Adora. We will definitely do that. And I will share uh, that uh, your recommendation and proposal with our DI team, but definitely. And I do believe also when it's also, some of the things are covered in the strategic plan from the EDI department, but I will make sure that those are also added to their plan. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Tiona, I just want to thank you for uh, the uh, the exciting way that you put together your report. You include pictures. I mean, it's a way mm -hmm. to see things visual. Some of us are visual learners, and uh, I have to fall in that category. But it's really neat to see where you've organized this thing and put together things like the pictures in here of the events taking place. It just uh, it helps make it even more exciting. So I really appreciate what you've done. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saul, and all the credit goes to our public service directors. But thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, moving right along here. We've got uh, support services reports. Anyone have any questions about any of those? Okay, there being no questions, move along to uh, the chief librarian's report. John. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I will also uh, take a, a page from Michael Brantner and say that I uh, will do my best to make it through this with, without a coughing fit. Um, I've got a couple things to, to talk about tonight. Um, uh, the first one I want to talk about is you're probably aware uh, that there was an announcement last night uh, by Governor Polis that masks will be distributed at public libraries. Um, I wanted to let you know that the Pikes Peak Library District um, will be a participant in this program. Uh, the rollout of this has been um, a, a, little, uh, a little wonky and there have been some issues with it. Um, so we have not received masks yet. However, we will be receiving them. Um, and we will have the benefit of learning from the many libraries that uh, suddenly found out what it was that they were signing up for when they responded to a rather cryptic email they received last week. Um, so we have on order 30,000 KN95s and about 15,000 uh, approximately, or, or 10,000, um, not sure exactly, it's okay, uh, of, the, of, of the surgical masks uh, that we will be distributing. Um, 
one of the statements in the governor's press release is that there is a limit of five masks per person per month. Um, there's been, th th there's no mechanism that they have given us to actually enforce that. So um, a lot of the, 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 the libraries are, are kind of conversing amongst ourselves and also with the acting state librarian who has uh, had an emergency meeting with the Department of Public Safety um, today to try to get some clarification on how this program is exactly supposed to work. Uh, many libraries have put a halt to it and will be restarting it on Monday um, once we can get some answers and once they can get a suitable number of, of, of masks. The libraries that did sign up for this program last week, most of them ran out within the first hour. Um, uh, so ho hopefully we will, we, we will be getting this started soon. Um, uh, for those of you who know me well, you know there's an awful lot I am not saying and I am... <laughs> doing my best not to say it. Okay, um, when it comes to the state librarian, uh, the, uh, the the search for a new state librarian unfortunately hit a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a problem. Um, and the person they offered the, the position to did not accept. Um, so we do still have an interim state librarian and they are reassessing how they, what, what they want to do moving forward. We recently at leadership team met to discuss two issues uh, that we discussed two weeks ago. Um, uh, with what was happening with Omicron, um, we wanted to just kind of reassess where we were in terms of uh, our requirement for staff to wear masks and also where we were with quarantine and isolation times. Um, two weeks ago, we had actually stayed with 10 days uh, because the information that was coming out from the CDC at that time was changing rather rapidly. And we wanted to kind of let things settle down before we made a decision on what we would do as an organization. Um, so we met earlier this week and we are still requiring masks of staff um, given the numbers in our county. And we are encouraging staff to wear N95s um, if possible. We are not requiring N95s unless we can actually supply them which is something we are also discussing. Uh, when it comes to the quarantine and isolation time, um, the CDC has put out guidelines that have seemed to have stuck for a few weeks now. And um, so we did move to a minimum five-day quarantine isolation time. Um, however, um, if you look at the actual um, guidelines, um, there are about 183 asterisks appended to that five days. So we have shared all of the information with the staff and are encouraging them to consult their medical professionals if they have any questions about what the appropriate quarantine or isolation time is for them. Because it gets into some very um, subjective questions such as, did you have mild, medium or severe COVID? Um, are you immunocompromised? It's getting into decisions, uh, a kind of a decision tree that it is not our place as an employer to make those decisions for an employee. Um, but we have adopted the CDC guidelines of a minimum five day quarantine. Um, it's not, it, it is still expected that many staff will need more, will need more time than that. And we are trusting them as they make that, that decision. We have stated to all staff that it is never appropriate for them to come in um, with symptoms or ill. And uh, all managers in this district have always been um, empowered to send people home if, if they are sick. Um, so city council, um, as you are aware, uh, the, um, the Richard Scorman seat uh, was considered kind of uh, the potential sixth vote uh, for city council in order to uh, complete the, um, to, to, to completely affirm the uh, two candidates that were put forward by uh, the board liaisons. Um, uh, Stephanie Finley Fortune has been approved to that seat as of last Friday. Um, however, they have not had a city council meeting uh, since then where they've been able to actually have the vote. So we'll keep an eye out on the agenda uh, to see when that vote happens. It is our assumption that um, that they will be put forward. We've uh, had, uh, I, I've had several discussions um, um, some, some great discussions with, with Aaron Bentz and, and, and had discussions with, with Aaron Salt. Um, I'm looking forward to them joining the board. 
and uh, we'll move forward when they do. I have informed both of them and they are both available uh, that the potential, uh, potential dates for the new board member orientation would be on February 4th and February 11th. Since then, um, we uh, have, have landed on February 11th um, for us. Um, and so we are moving forward with that date. Uh, of course, that will be contingent on them having been approved by city council. If they haven't been approved by that point, we'll, we'll push the date forward. Uh, we'll, we'll push the date in, in, into February. Um, but that is the date that was available for both of them. So it, it seems like it, like, like it could work. Um, so uh, other than that, I just really want to do a couple thank yous um, really quickly. I want to thank all of leadership team, Heather and, and Randy and, and Mike, even though he's not here, um, for the work that they put forward on the salary study. Um, this has been a, a, a long and very involved process, but we are ready to go and we'll be rolling it out to the staff um, on February 3rd and February 4th, uh, February 3rd to the management team, February 4th to uh, the entire staff, and then the staff will see that reflected in a later, in a later pay period. Um, they will see the uh, the four percent though in in this upcoming uh, this up, upcoming paycheck. Um, so, uh, I, on behalf of the staff, I just want to thank the board once again um, for the four percent pay increase um, that that was uh, provided to us last year. Um, and then the last thank you. <laughs> this just goes to the entire staff. Um, it's been the past several weeks have been unlike any others during the pandemic. Um, I'll actually say that in their own way, from a staffing perspective, um, the past two weeks have been the hardest weeks of the pandemic in terms of, of staff being out. Um, you know, just as an example, currently 30% of leadership team has COVID. Um, it, that doesn't necessarily translate to the entire staff, but um, it sometimes feels like it in, in a lot of the departments. The staff has been phenomenal at coming together, at helping each other out, at moving where, where they're needed. And with just a few exceptions, we've managed to keep things going without any additional closures. There have been one or two um, you know, closures or, or late openings, but overall so far they've managed to just do an incredible job of keeping things going. Um, services has been helping out in the branches um, like never before. It's been amazing to see. It's not something that's sustainable. Uh, and we are having discussions about what we can do to make sure that we don't burn out um, or that we have contingency plans for what to happen, what, what we can do if this continues. So that's it, unless there's any questions. John. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry, I couldn't appreciate get off. what you guys gone through and the fact that you've done these things uh, and, and despite you're here today, just like you and Michael are having uh, problems with uh, with COVID, but you, you managed to be here. And uh, we just thank you for your leadership and for what you've been doing during this time and, and basically all the time you've been in charge. Um, I do have a, a question, uh, if I may. Um, were there any discussions about reducing hours or potentially, I, I'm, I'm trying not to say closing a library, but were there any discussions amongst the leadership staff about the number of people that were out because of COVID and either shuffling people around to keep a library open, even if they're at reduced hours? So um, we have a broad discussion about that at every leadership team where we discuss what would be at a very high level uh, because the decisions on the specifics we like to leave to public services and, and to the directors with our kind of guidance. Um, but we do have discussions about closures versus, um, versus reduced hours. Uh, one of the things that we've discussed is pairing branches together. So for instance, one might be open in the morning to mid afternoon, the other one would be open in, in, in afternoon into, into evening so that there's the same amount of hours that just might be split between, between two branches. The public service directors, and Tayona can jump in if I get any of this wrong, um, have had 
a lot of discussions on this, including prioritizing branches within their regions. Um, the staff already is moving around. That is, that, 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 that's the only way we've been able to keep doing um, and, and keep the doors open in, in the way that we have. It's happening more in some regions than others. I, I go ahead and I, I'd like to commend the Southeast um, because the Southeast has seen, I think uh, 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 it seems to have hit them harder than it has the, the, the North and the West and they've managed to really keep things going. Um, a, a lot of that comes uh, from kind of the attitude that their regional director, Abby, instilled in them at the beginning of the pandemic, um, that they were like one of the first regions that really started coming together and thinking regionally. That spread to the entire district since then, but that's, that, that's definitely stayed the case. Um, so the public service directors have had quite a few meetings on this. I, I can't get into the specifics of it other than to say, I know that there has been prioritizations of branches and discussions on what to do as things as things do deteriorate. Did you yes. want to add, Tayona? Yep. Yes, definitely. I agree with John. And even yesterday, we had a meeting and we have a plan as if what I get COVID and I'm not doing well. And it's actually very detailed. Um, and we had, there is a schedule who will be doing what. So yes, we are already talking about and having a plan. But again, it's very unpredictable. Um, so, and, uh, but probably again, regional directors, service directors, and uh, myself, we've been having a lot of conversations. Thank you. And, and one thing I definitely wanna say in my effusive praise of the Southeast, um, I do not want that to ever seem like, <laughs> like, like, like the North and the West have not been doing um, also just an equal amount of, of in, in incredible work. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, move along to board reports uh, with the governor's committee report. Yes, we met um, and are on January 4th and uh, we uh, signed up and I think everybody has received the sign up list uh, for adopting a, a library or a, uh, a place for us to go. Uh, those appointments were all made and Laura will get that all together for us once we uh, find out uh, who our new um, board of trustee members are once that's announced. Uh, I think we're all assuming that it'll be Aaron and Aaron, but I'm not, we still don't know for sure. And then we will begin our duties to go out into the different areas. Um, we reviewed the board orientation agenda. It, uh, John did let us know that it's gonna be very similar to last year. There's gonna be some additional components uh, to remind us about different things that we believe, our philosophy in the library, et cetera. But, and John, I'm glad uh, you, uh, they were gonna to touch base and find out the new board members when would it be feasible and at February the 11th. I encourage all of us to go. It's always good reminders to learn or, uh, I know I'm going again, cause last year when I went, that's when COVID or two years ago, whenever it happened, it seemed like uh, it just started and it was kind of chaotic that day. Um, we, um, we did discuss, it wasn't formal, formalized. We discussed it, I don't know whether uh, we kind of agreed it would be nice to start holding some of our uh, meetings at some of the branches. Of course, right now, just like Tiona says, everything is so unknown from day to day, minute to minute, that it's kind of hard to make those plans and depending on the technology that's available for us to uh, have our meetings. Uh, but we did talk about that and eventually maybe we'll go back to it because it is an opportunity for us to get to know other libraries and what's going on at the branches. Uh, and Debbie is compiling the data from uh, John's evaluation. Uh, I believe it's still on the go that we will uh, be uh, talking about that at the February meeting. Correct, Debbie? That's correct. So thank you all for getting your um, evaluations done. So I am putting 
all the information together. It will go to the governance committee at the committee meetings and then um, it should be on the agenda for executive session in February. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and finally, uh, one of the things that we'll begin talking about, I think John and Laura will help with that, is looking at what we'll do for Wayne's Farewell. Um, so details will be forthcoming on what we're going to do there. So thank you very much. It was my first meeting. I hope I did okay. Thanks, Laura. I mean, thanks to Dawn. Thank you very much. Uh, Internal Affairs Committee. Um, we met and um, we talked with Gary and with Rich about their proposals that you've already voted on tonight. So um, I don't have really anything else to report. Took away your thunder actually, right? That's okay. Yeah. All right, Debbie, thank you. Uh, Public Affairs Committee. The Public Affairs did meet and we talked through a timeline for the ballot measure and whether or not that is something that will move forward. We have a couple of things um, in the works over this next month or two months, who knows, I don't know. Um, we are trying to put together a schedule to meet with some elected officials and poor Laura has that lovely task of trying to fit in with everybody's schedules. But I think that's also just gone to, you know, maybe February. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what we talked about, and um, keep you posted. All right, thank you, Mina. Mina. Um, board President's report. Uh, two things. First of all, I, uh, I attended the committee committee's uh, meeting on the 4th of uh, January, and uh, very interesting because most of the things we bring up for uh, discussion and voting uh, goes there first, so it does get... Uh, chance to look at and discuss and question and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, even if you don't get that information initially, that you realize that the members of the board have been looking at these things um, in more, more detail and ask questions and whatnot. So uh, I'd also say that like, like today, you know, I didn't expect to be doing this uh, meeting by Zoom. I'm sure a lot of you are the same way, but there are things that happen that which we have no control. And, uh, you know, we want to take care of uh, the people we work with and the people we support. And uh, it's like the illness going around. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to, to guarantee your plan on doing something a certain way when, in fact, you know it's going to have to change in order to, uh, to cover, cover all the bases. So you just have to be flexible. So that's, that's all I have to say. Anybody else have any questions or comments before we uh, dismiss here? Okay, with an hour and 13 minutes for a meeting, it's pretty good for a good start for uh, January. So I declare that our meeting's adjourned at 6.13 p.m. All right, Rick. Thank you, we appreciate everyone. the efficiency. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, have a good evening. Get well. Take care, everybody. <laughs> yes, everybody. Get better. Have a good evening, everyone. And everyone wish Laura a very happy vacation. She's heading to Hawaii tomorrow. <laughs> and, and enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> I heard there's no, I heard there's no, uh, there's no COVID there. That's a pretty good deal, Laura. I mean, I hope that. That. of course, coming yeah. from here, please don't be the one that introduces it to the island. So. <laughs> well. um, I'll try my best, and I will take pictures of my feet in front of the ocean. Ah, uh, okay. uh, so, yes. Please do, as you should. Yes, mm -hmm. I'll be doing Enjoy. the same in a couple of weeks too. Yeah. Hi, right, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Everybody have a great week. See you next month.